let's consider an example now um, from game theory where information may well have negative value. So we're going to, going to consider a game of incomplete information. You may have not seen these before, but we'll go through them quite carefully. So consider the following game of incomplete information. Uh, well, we start with a chance node. Essentially, nature is going to choose one of two things, whether it is state one or state two. Now, nature is, is a player in this game in a sense, but they're going, it's going to follow a prescribed strategy where it chooses state one with uh, probability one half and chooses state two with probability one half as well. Once nature has chosen the state of the world, we arrive at terminal nodes where something is going to happen, which we'll describe in a moment. We're going to assume for now, however, that um, these terminal nodes, whether it's state one or state two, are contained in the same information set for all players in this game. So when players play the following games, we'll describe in a moment, they do not know the state of the world. So if the state is state one, this is the game that will be played. Here we see um, there are two players in this game, Anne and Bob. Anne has two actions to choose from, up or down. Bob has three actions to choose from. He can choose left, middle or right. Of course, both players' payoffs depend on the choice of their own action and the other player's action, which is what makes this a game. In state two, we see a similar situation where, should that state occur, Anne and Bob will be playing a different game. So there is incomplete information here in the sense that neither player knows precisely which game they are playing. So how do we solve a game like this? Well, what we're going to do is construct a strategically equivalent game and then use the concept of Nash equilibrium, whereby each player is choosing a best response on the belief that the other player is also using a best response. So let's go through the details for this now. So what do I mean by a strategically equivalent game? Well, it means that um, for any pair of actions chosen by these players, the expected payoffs are exactly the same as the expected payoffs in the game of incomplete information above. Let's look at what happens uh, if Anne chooses up and Bob chooses left. We can see here, I've changed the color to pink, that in state one, Anne gets a payoff of four, and in state two, Anne also gets a payoff of four. So Anne's payoff um, does not depend on the state of the world in that case. So let's put four uh, as her payoff when she chooses up and when Bob chooses left in, our, in the game that we are constructing. Now, if we look at the two games and just check that Anne receives the same payoff in both games um, in each state of the world. So if Anne plays up and Bob plays middle, she receives a payoff of two in both states of the world. So we can fill in the rest of the payoffs for Anne and she'll get a payoff of two if she chooses up when Bob chooses middle, a payoff of two if she chooses up when Bob chooses right. She'll get a payoff of six if she chooses down when Bob chooses left and she'll get a payoff of zero when she chooses down, whether Bob chooses middle or whether Bob chooses right. So these are the payoffs for Anne in our strategically equivalent game. Now let's have a look at Bob's payoffs. Well, you can see that if Bob chooses left and Anne chooses up, he gets four in both states of the world. And if Bob chooses left and Anne chooses down, he gets seven in both states of the world. So in this case, whenever Bob chooses left, his payoffs do not at all depend on the state of the world. They depend on Anne's action, but not on what nature has chosen before. 
so we can fill in the uh, table for our strategically equivalent game. Bob's payoffs when he chooses left are four if Anne chooses up and seven if Anne chooses down. Now let's have a look at what happens if Bob is choosing the middle action. In this case, well, if Anne is choosing up when Bob is choosing the middle action, now his payoff depends on the state of the world. In state one, Bob will get a payoff of zero, but in state two, Bob will get a payoff of six. Now, Bob doesn't know the state of the world, but he does know that there is a probability one half that each state will occur. And so we can take an expected payoff. Bob knows that his expected payoff is halfway between zero and six, which is three. So let's put three as the payoff in our strategically equivalent game, which is the same as the expected payoff in the game above. Continuing this, if we look at what happens if Bob chooses right when Anne chooses up, again it depends on the state of the world. He gets a payoff of 6 in state 1 and a payoff of 0 in state 2, and so his expected payoff is 3. So let's put that 3 into our table. If Bob chooses middle when Anne chooses down, depending on the state of the world, he either receives 0 or 8, both are equally likely, and so his payoff is 4. And if Bob chooses right, then his payoff is either 8 or 0 when Anne chooses down again. It depends on the state of the world. In state 1, his payoff is 8. In state 2, his payoff is 0. But his expected payoff is therefore 4 again. So let's put that 4 into the table. So now we've completely described a normal form game, we know the pairs of payoffs for every pair of actions and all of the payoffs in this game that we've constructed are the same as the expected payoffs in the game of incomplete information. Now we can use the concept of Nash equilibrium to solve this game. The technique I like to use is called cell by cell inspection. If you haven't heard of this before, Please just look it up online and read about it. I'll show you how it works though. You are guaranteed to find every Nash equilibrium in pure strategies using this technique. So the technique goes as follows. We start from Anne's point of view, player one, who is Anne, and she imagines what Bob is thinking. And she says, well, if Bob is going to choose left, then I have a choice between up and down, and the payoffs will be four or six, and six is better. Anne's best response, if she believes Bob will choose left, is to choose down. Now underline the payoff associated with down when Bob chooses left, so we're going to underline that six. We now continue this um, with Anne imagining each action that Bob might take. So if Anne believes that Bob will choose the middle action, she has a choice between up or down, and the payoffs are two or zero, and so up is the best response for Anne when Bob, when Bob chooses the middle action. Let's underline that payoff of two. Finally, if Anne imagines that Bob will choose the right action, then um, she's choosing between a payoff of two or zero by choosing action up or down. Her best response is to choose the action up, in which case she gets a payoff of two. So let's underline that payoff. So now we've underlined the payoffs associated with each of Anne's best response, um, where her, she's best responding to each possible belief that she has about Bob's behavior. Now we do this the other way around. So Bob is going, to, um, is going to say, well, suppose I believe that Anne will play up, then I'm choosing between left, middle and right with payoffs four, three and three, four being the highest. So Bob's best response when he believes that Anne will go up is to choose the action left with a payoff of four. So let's underline that payoff. 
Now, if Bob believes that Anne will choose the down action, again, Bob has three choices, left, middle or right. He's comparing payoffs 7, 4 and 4. Of course, 7 is the highest. And so Bob's best response to the belief that Anne will choose the down action is to choose the left action again. So let's underline that payoff of 7. And now we've completed the cell by cell inspection. The trick is to now look at all the cells. And whenever you see a cell that has two payoffs underlined, you have found the Nash equilibrium. In general, there may be many Nash equilibria in a game. This technique will find all of the Nash equilibria in pure strategies. In this case, the Nash equilibrium is down left. So Anne chooses down and Bob chooses left and they receive payoffs six, seven. Anne receives a payoff of six and Bob receives a payoff of seven. Notice here that we would never describe a Nash equilibrium in terms of uh, in, by just saying the Nash equilibrium is six, seven, because there may be other cells that contain the same payoffs, but are not Nash equilibria. So always describe Nash equilibria by the actions that the player are, players are taking. In this case, Anne is choosing down and Bob is choosing left and their payoffs are six and seven. Please make a note of their payoffs um, in, for this game as it's going to be relevant as we study what happens as we add more information to the game. Now that we've solved a game of incomplete information and found that Anne got a payoff of six in the only equilibrium and Bob got a payoff of seven, let's go back to the beginning and suppose that both players did know the state of the world. Okay, so they had more information. In fact, we're going to assume more information than this. We're going to assume what's called common knowledge. So not only do both players know the state of the world, but both players know that the other player knows the state of the world, and they know that that player knows that they know the state of the world, and so on. So way more information than before. So let's have a look at the game again. Here is the original game of incomplete information with an information set around the two terminal nodes where each of these state games were played. Let's remove that information set. So, or if you prefer, you could draw each node having an information set around it by itself in an information set, but it's not very common to, to, to draw them when they're having no effect. So here is a game where the players know the state of the world before they choose their action. And so um, we now can actually identify two proper subgames. OK, the game in state one is a well-defined subgame and the game in state two is also a well-defined subgame of this larger game. And so we can apply the concept of subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. All this means is that in each of these subgames, the players will be playing Nash equilibrium strategies. Okay, so how do we find these? Well, look at one of the state games at a time, use cell by cell inspection, and underline the payoffs of all of the best responses uh, as we did before. Here I've done it for you. You can see the payoffs associated with Anne's best responses underlined in pink and the payoffs associated with Bob's best responses underlined in blue. So we can identify the Nash equilibria in each of the subgames. So in the state one game, the Nash equilibria is up right with payoffs two, six. And in the state two subgame, the Nash equilibrium would be uh, up middle with payoffs two and six also. So let's describe the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. It's essentially a profile of strategies. So I've denoted Sigma star Anne as Anne's subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy. You could think of it as a function that depends on the state of the world. And Sigma star Bob is Bob's uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy. So Sigma star Anne just says choose up in both states. Up is her best response in both states or is the equilibrium action in both of these subgames. And for Bob, his um, 
his action, his equilibrium action now depends on the state of the world. So it's uh, he will choose right if he knows that we are in state one, and he will choose middle if he knows that we're in state two. Okay, so that's the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this game. Uh, it's quite simple to describe. Now let's look at the payoffs. The payoffs in both of these subgames is two for Anne and six for Bob. Now remember, when there was incomplete information, when these players did not know the state of the world, the, the only Nash equilibrium of that game had payoffs six, seven. Here, the payoffs for both players has dropped to uh, two for Anne and six for Bob. So both players are worse off, even though they have better information. Okay, so this is an example of a uh, where of where information can have negative value. In a sense, Anne and Bob would be happy to pay a certain amount in order to make sure that nobody knows the state of the world. They will both be better off if that occurs. Again, this is a, a recurring idea that we've we've noticed already that really it's not the fact that each player knows more that is the problem. The problem is that each player knows that the other player knows more. Okay, so if Bob was trying to convince Anne that he was going to go left, well, that is a credible threat when Anne knows that Bob has no information about the state of the world. But if Anne knows that Bob knows the state of the world, then his um, threat to choose the left action is no longer credible. She knows that in state one, he will choose right, and she knows that in state two, he will choose middle. Okay, so know, uh, knowing more in itself, not a bad thing at all, but being known to know more can be a bad thing. So that concludes our study of the value of information. Today, we've developed the theory of the value of information in single person decision problems and shown that it must be non-negative. Then, as we moved to models which included more agents, so in a competitive insurance market, we looked at the Hirschleifer effect and also we looked at games of incomplete information. In those scenarios, it's, it's quite possible for information to have negative value. Of course, information in itself is never a bad thing, and knowing more is not bad in itself. Rather, being known to know more. If other people know that you know more, then that can lead to worse outcomes. Next week, we're going to be continuing our study of asymmetric information, but we're going to be looking at a different type of asymmetric information. So far, we've looked at what you might call hidden types. So we had different types of consumers. Last week, we had high risk and low risk consumers, and it was possible that nobody could identify their types. That was the assumption we made under asymmetric information. Well, next week, we're going to be looking at something called hidden action. So in this sense, a, a, an agent in our model will make decisions, but nobody will be able to verify what decision they actually made. We will look at a principal agent model where an employer wants to design a wage contract to incentivize his employee to uh, put in the appropriate amount of effort. Of course, asymmetric information in this case can lead to something called moral hazard. So looking forward to next week. In the meantime, take care.